Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named The Strain Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a flashback to the winter of 1932, when Abraham was just a child, living with his grandmother in a remote village in Romania. His grandmother told him a story about a giant who ate children. It was said that there was a nobleman in Albania named Sardu. He suffered from gigantism since childhood. As he grew older, his body became increasingly large but also in great pain. Although he was young, he could only walk with the help of a cane. It was a silver cane with a wolf's head handle, the wolf being the emblem of the Sardu family. His brother believed that wolf's blood could cure his illness, so he organized a hunting expedition in the winter. Unfortunately, they searched the forest for days but couldn't find any wolves. Instead, they were targeted by other creatures. They went from being hunters to becoming prey. His brother and the hunting party were lured away, and by the time Sardu found his brother following the footprints, all he saw was a lifeless body on the ground. His brother's head had been crushed into mashed potatoes. Sardu wanted to avenge his brother, so holding a torch, he entered the cave alone, only to encounter the creature and lose his own life in the process. The monster was excited by Sardu's enormous body and shot out a tendril, knocking him down. Then it stuffed a handful of dirt from a coffin into Sardu's mouth, causing numerous bloodworms to be vomited out. Those worms crawled into Sardu's body through his ears and nostrils, causing him unbearable pain and torment. But after the pain, Sardu changed. His eyes turned red, and he let out a beastly growl, taking advantage of the long night to return to his castle. From then on, Sardu's figure was never seen on the streets during the day, but every night, outside the windows of children, the sound of his cane tapping the ground could be heard. Children who heard this sound all disappeared, and not long after, their bloodless bodies were found in the forest. The grandmother's story left young Abraham stunned, but it also planted a seed of salvation in his heart. His grandmother said that he had to stop the monster that occupied Sardu's body and wreaked havoc everywhere, and the monster was later revealed to be the exact Bloodmaster. Back to the present timeline, after the last failure, Abraham found out that sunlight could not kill the Bloodmaster. He felt doubtful, wondering what had gone wrong. In order to figure out the problem, he went to Church Street alone and entered the underground tunnel. Along the way, he discovered a piece of cloth belonging to the Bloodmaster. Then some strange noises came from within the tunnel. Abraham followed the sound and saw a vampire who introduced himself as Vaughn, the servant of the vampire ancestors. Without further explanation, Vaughn captured and took Abraham to his secret base. However, Vaughn had no ill intentions towards Abraham. He simply wanted to propose a collaboration. Vaughn took Abraham to meet his masters and explained their intentions. There were seven vampire ancestors whose consciousnesses were connected and could sense each other's actions. However, the seventh ancestor possessed the ability to sever consciousness. He betrayed the ancient truce and became the blood master known to humans. When Abraham injured him, his power went out of control. The other six ancestors witnessed the battle and learned of Abraham's existence, so they wanted to strike a deal with him to fight against the blood master. As a condition, Abraham must inform Vaughn's hunting team once the Bloodmaster was found. Abraham was reluctant to agree, and instead mentioned an ancient book called The Oxido Lumen. The vampire ancestors were alerted upon hearing about the book, as it recorded the secrets of their strain, Strigoi, and contained a method to kill even the vampire ancestors. Hence, they considered eliminating Abraham. However, faced with a greater enemy, they decided to spare him and let him go. As Abraham was leaving, the vampire ancestors performed a gruesome act of eating a living human, both to satisfy their hunger and to intimidate Abraham. However, Abraham was not scared. Gus, who was next to him, was frightened by that. Abraham knew that the ancient book still existed in 1965. At that time, he was a professor at Vienna's university, and his wife Miriam was still alive at that time. One day, while Abraham was teaching, a wealthy young man in a wheelchair, who claimed to be an admirer of Abraham and believed in the existence of vampires, came to see him. This wealthy man turned out to be the young Palmer. In order to gain Abraham's trust, Palmer mentioned the story of Sardu and claimed to know the whereabouts of the wolf-headed cane. Abraham had always wanted to discover the truth and accepted Palmer's help without questioning his motives. With the help of Palmer, Abraham found a shop that mostly contained items from World War II. He paid his attention to a wolf-headed cane displayed on the counter. The shopkeeper praised the cane. However, when Abraham wanted to pay and take the item, the shopkeeper claimed it was already reserved. 
Abraham couldn't persuade the shopkeeper with more money. Instead, he exposed the shopkeeper's true identity, a former Nazi doctor who conducted experiments on prisoners during the war. After Germany's defeat, he changed his name and hid in Vienna to make a living. The shopkeeper, not wanting a confrontation, fled, leaving the cane behind, so Abraham took it away. When the shopkeeper returned to his shop later that night, a customer whom the cane was reserved for was waiting for him. The customer was actually the same Thomas who later became the Bloodmaster's servant. Thomas despised him for not being able to handle the situation well. He shot out his tendril and turned the man into a vampire on the spot. After Abraham got the cane, Palmer arranged to meet him again. Palmer finally revealed his true intentions and took out a picture from the ancient book, saying that the book recorded the origin of vampires. The book had changed hands many times in the last century, and its whereabouts were unknown. Palmer hoped Abraham could find it, offering to guarantee Abraham's promotion to a full professorship. Tempted, Abraham agreed, even though he knew he was being used and disregarded Miriam's advice. Nearly half a century later, Abraham had still not found the said mysterious book. He deduced from the vampire ancestors' reactions that the book indeed existed. After returning to the residence provided by the pest control expert Fett, he remembered he had a storage room and suggested they retrieve items from it the next day. Fett had been busy preparing for the Bloodmaster's attack. He had been welding and reinforcing doors and windows, and even considering extending the defense to nearby streets. This required clearing the area of infected individuals. Meanwhile, the CDC doctor Ephraim and his assistant Nora believed that the bloodworm infection could be cured with modern science. They went to a friend's lab to find medicine, but discovered the researchers inside had already been infected. So the pair returned to the base to devise a plan. They had two options, develop a vaccine to break the infection chain or mass-produce regenerative organs. Unfortunately, both approaches were difficult to implement without living test subjects or equipment. Ephraim also had to discipline his son, Zach. The boy's personality had changed since his transformation, and he was full of hatred because Ephraim wouldn't let him see his mother. Despite witnessing the transformation of vampires, Zach refused to believe that his mother, Kelly, had become a monster, blaming his father for not saving her. The next day, Ephraim and Nora came up with a new plan. They would create a new plague, using other lethal viruses to infect the infected and thereby break the infection chain. The only problem was finding living test subjects. When Abraham took them to the storage room, they encountered a couple hiding in a warehouse. The couple had been scratched by vampires during an attack. Abraham also found the storage room, containing many silver weapons and his old research notes on vampires. Back at the residence, Abraham spent nights going through the notes, hoping to find clues about the ancient book. During this time, Fett and Dutch went to the nearby streets to clear out the infected. Their first stop was a bathhouse. Drawing from their previous experience, the two headed straight to the dark and damp underground bathroom and found large areas of bloodstains on the walls. Inside were many infected people, asleep. They used the silver bullets made by Abraham to give the infected a surprise explosion. They then decapitated the remaining ones who could still move. After dealing with all the infected, the two took time to enjoy a refreshing swim in the pool, with their smelly hormones filling the water. On the other side, Ephraim brought the infected couple back to the lab, explained the situation to them, and persuaded them to become test subjects for their experiments. The couple decided to sacrifice themselves for the fight against the plague. Ephraim then sampled the brain matter of the vampires and began experimenting in petri dishes. He added various highly infectious viruses to the dishes, but the results were not as expected. The viruses were instantly eradicated, and the test subjects' conditions worsened. The wife was in pain and showed signs of transformation, so they had to use painkillers to stabilize her condition. Seeing this, the husband began to have second thoughts. Ephraim, worried that they would run away, had no choice but to tie them to the hospital beds. However, after controlling them, Ephraim felt somewhat desperate. If they couldn't find a suitable virus before the test subjects fully transformed, the experiment would be declared a failure. Fortunately, Nora discovered a pure experimental strain of bacteria left by a friend and, after some manipulation, cultivated a new strain that could devour the brain matter of vampires. 
This news excited Ephraim, and the two immediately cultivated more strains and injected them into the test subjects. As Ephraim and Nora made progress, Abraham also found a clue. It was a piece of paper tucked inside a notebook, the very same picture Palmer had given him years ago. Meanwhile, Palmer was still busy serving the Bloodmaster. As he was now possessing Sardu's body that had been burned by sunlight, it could no longer support the Bloodmaster's spirit. He needed a new host. Therefore, he summoned Thomas and instructed him to have the transferred survivor Bolivar steal back the soil stored in the theater and find some children for him. This task could only be carried out by the aging Palmer, who was eager to serve the Bloodmaster in exchange for an immortal life to cure his illness. When he saw the burns on the corner of Thomas's mouth, he couldn't help but mock him for being injured by Abraham and his vampire hunting team. At this point, Palmer didn't know about the Bloodmaster's injury, so he didn't use it as leverage to threaten Thomas. At this time, a woman named Coco appeared. She was a real estate agent, and Palmer wanted to buy a new residence for the Bloodmaster. She happened to have a factory on hand, which included a sewer system capable of transporting liquid, perfectly meeting the Bloodmaster's needs. Palmer then signed the contract. Following this, he sponsored a school for the blind, providing the children with passage out of Manhattan so they could attend classes away from the epidemic in the suburbs. The naive principal of the blind school believed him and led the children onto a bus. However, when the bus arrived at its destination, they were greeted by Thomas at the entrance of a factory. All the children became food for the Bloodmaster. To exact revenge, the Bloodmaster had Thomas awaken Kelly and reserve her obsession for her son, Zack. They then entered the basement of the factory, where a pool filled with soil was located. As Thomas chanted, the infected children emerged from the soil, the very same blind children. Under Kelly's control, the children saw the people before them as their mothers, but Kelly couldn't sense Zack's scent on any of them. She directly twisted off one child's head. As this tragedy unfolded, Palmer, the mastermind behind it all, reached a cooperation with the mayor, presenting himself as a generous benefactor aiding New York during the epidemic. He then offered the real estate agent a high-paying position as his secretary. Faced with a generous salary, Coco resigned from her job and joined Palmer immediately. So when he built a food distribution center, Coco quickly crafted a dramatic speech. On the opening day, Palmer was somewhat embarrassed to read the speech, but the atmosphere at the venue was effectively stirred up. However, this distribution center was not as simple as it seemed. Although it provided essential goods to the public, people still had to obtain credentials for free access. They were asked to provide their blood type as proof of identity instead of their ID. At this point, Abraham appeared in the crowd and exchanged glances with Palmer. Palmer was informed that the Bloodmaster had been injured. This left him feeling defeated, but he ordered his subordinates to apprehend Abraham. Unfortunately for Palmer, Fett was well prepared, causing an explosion at the scene and whisking Abraham away amidst the chaos. Abraham's actions were meant to probe whether Palmer had the ancient book. He confronted Palmer and surmised that the ancient book was not in his possession. This meant that they had a chance to find the book. On the other side, Dr. Barnes, the new director of the New York Health Department, was already making moves. He proposed to the mayor to establish quarantine stations, isolating all infected individuals and observing them for 24 hours while investigating people they had been in contact with. If anyone was found to be infected, force would be used to restrict their movements, but this was akin to providing covert protection for the infected. The scene shifts to the vampire-turned-Bolivar, who had received Thomas's orders for the Bloodmaster's plan. He was packing soil left from the vampire coffin and transporting it to the factory every night. However, he didn't use any vehicle, but rather walked the streets in a strange dress, dragging the package behind him. This caught the attention of two patrolling officers. They opened the package's zipper and found it full of unremarkable soil. But as soon as an officer reached in, countless bloodworms burrowed into his skin from the soil. Bolivar then let out a long howl, and several vampires leaped down from the building above, quickly dealing with the officers. After completing the task, Bolivar received a new order to become Palmer's security guard. Palmer was unaware of this arrangement, but faced with Thomas's threat, he had no choice but to accept the surveillance. However, after Thomas left, Palmer was full of curiosity towards Bolivar, thinking that he would also become one of this kind. He constantly asked questions, which annoyed Bolivar. He despised humans just as humans despised vampires, but both of them were ultimately servants of the vampires. Palmer wanted to communicate with the Bloodmaster through him. Even though the Bloodmaster could observe the outside world through the eyes of his kind, Bolivar couldn't sense the Bloodmaster and advised Palmer not to waste his efforts. 
However, their conversation raised Coco's suspicions. Her intuition told her that there was a problem with Bolivar and Thomas, and she urged Palmer not to associate with them, but she was coldly rejected by her new boss. Meanwhile, Ephraim's experiments continued. He injected the virus into test subjects, but the reaction was too fast, and the mutated wife died in pain. He could only pin his hopes on another test subject. While waiting for the results, Ephraim returned to base to rest. Fett had just come back from outside, having printed warning posters and plastered them around the neighborhood, and was preparing to blow up the subway tunnel. The base was located in the Red Hook District, surrounded by water on three sides. Once the tunnel was destroyed, the entrance to Manhattan would be sealed off. But Ephraim was not in the mood to listen to Fett, as he discovered that his mischievous son, Zack, had disappeared, probably for only an hour. They went out to search for him and coincidentally saw a bus leaving. Ephraim quickly chased after it and, sure enough, found Zack on board. Zack left without saying goodbye because he thought his mother wanted to see him and had to go find her. Ephraim was speechless and could only give his son a big hug. Beside Dutch, she saw a missing person poster on a pole. The photo on the poster was of her ex-girlfriend, Nikki, the one who had stolen all her belongings. Dutch still had feelings for Nikki and couldn't help but worry. This made Fett uncomfortable. When Zack returned to the base, Fett tried to distract himself by chatting with Abraham, but he was ignored. Abraham had locked himself to conduct experiments. It turned out that after beheading a vampire one night, he had secretly collected some bloodworms into a bottle. He then boiled the bloodworms in water and repeatedly filtered and processed them. After refining the bloodworms into a liquid, he poured it into a brown bottle and dripped the extract into his eyes. However, the next day when Nora called Abraham for breakfast, she found him collapsed on the floor, his eyes bleeding and not even breathing. Nora quickly administered first aid and after some coughing, Abraham was saved. But Abraham didn't want to reveal the truth and lied that bleeding eyes were a sign of old age. Nora was skeptical and when Abraham felt better, she asked him about it as a friend. He confessed that he was already 94 years old. His agility at such an advanced age wasn't due to good health, but rather because he sustained his life by consuming bloodworms. These creatures couldn't be eaten directly, but had to be refined into a liquid and absorbed through the eyes. This practice went against Abraham's beliefs, but he'd rather die fighting Bloodmaster than slowly wither away as a frail old man. Nora understood Abraham's feelings and promised to help keep his secret. Later, Nora went to work in the lab. Ephraim had already started working, and to prevent his son from causing more trouble and running away, he had brought him along. But Zack didn't understand his good intentions and challenged his experiments. He even hated that his father referred to the infected as vampires. While Ephraim stepped out to compose himself, Zack knocked over a vial of the virus that Ephraim and Nora had painstakingly created. Ephraim chose to reason with Zack, and grabbing him by the collar, he brought him to the bedside of an experimental subject to see the true nature of a vampire. The monster with flesh tendril protruding from its mouth was what his mother looked like now. Zack was frightened into silence, and only then did Ephraim feel reassured enough to continue with his experiments. He injected the experimental subject with the virus, and surprisingly, the results were quite good. The subject had no violent reactions, but it kept staring at Zack. Ephraim guessed that the Bloodmaster was observing Zack, so he boldly declared that he would kill thousands of vampires, and that if cornered, he would kill Zack and then himself, never allowing the Bloodmaster to turn them. Meanwhile, to destroy the subway tunnel, Fett and Dutch decided to conduct a field investigation. However, Dutch was somewhat distracted. Seeing two women showing affection to each other on the street, she recalled the poster from the night before. She speculated that it was Nikki's mother who had posted it and wanted to find her. Fett knew that Nikki was a lingering issue for Dutch, so he decided to face the problem together and drove Dutch to Nikki's house. Upon entering, however, Nikki's mother didn't welcome Dutch and blamed her for ruining her daughter's life. Dutch didn't want to argue and just reminded Nikki's mother to let her know if she heard any news about Nikki. While the two women were talking, Fett was still in the car, listening to the radio. A female senator had reportedly arrived in Washington and she disagreed with Barnes's approach to home quarantine. She decided to use force to clear the area. Thus, Staten Island in New York became the first plague-free area. To show her determination to fight to the end, she had the bodies of vampires hung out for public display. Anyone entering Staten Island would see the dismembered corpses of vampires. Fett quite agreed with this approach, but he didn't know about the political deals taking place behind the scenes. The mayor of New York initially didn't support the senator's methods, but seeing their effectiveness and fearing she would steal the spotlight, he privately spoke to her. 
He agreed to grant her authority to command, but only if he would share the credit, making it appear that they were fighting the epidemic together. The senator had no choice but to agree. Fett wanted to share the good news with Dutch, but upon her return, he saw her in a fit of rage, clearly wronged at Nikki's house. Before Fett could comfort her, she passionately approached him, and they began to let loose in the narrow but hormone-smelly cabin. On the other side, Vaughn's vampire team was also in action. They planned to kidnap Palmer and had Gus disguise as an elevator repairman to enter the building. This distraction allowed Vaughn's team to infiltrate the underground, waiting for Gus to control the security guard leading the way. After modifying the elevator sensors, Vaughn and his team all fell to the bottom of the elevator shaft, then used the elevator to reach Palmer's office floor. However, the security in the control room noticed something strange and quickly took Palmer and Coco away. Vaughn knew little about human technology. He fell into a trap. Palmer activated the room's ultraviolet light system, leaving the Vaughn team with nowhere to escape. They were completely wiped out. Only Gus, who was still a human, managed to escape. At the same time, Ephraim's experiment showed results. The test subject's body became less swollen after the infection spread throughout. This indicated that they wouldn't die easily, and it was time to test the transmission. Ephraim decided to poison the subjects that night and asked Fett to help transport the test subject to a subway entrance. The tunnel there was the largest vampire lair in the Red Hook district. However, when the test subject was taken out of the car, he did not enter the tunnel but turned to another road. The three had to follow him. They soon arrived at a psychiatric hospital and dealt with the vampires nearby. Inside, Nora found medical records at the front desk, one of which belonged to the test subject's son. It turned out that the couple's child had schizophrenia and was being treated in the psychiatric hospital. But everyone there had been infected, and the test subject's son was missing. Upon arrival, the test subject slept in a room with others of his kind, naturally transmitting the infection to other vampires. On the other hand, Gus had nowhere to go after escaping. He wandered the streets and used his remaining cash to eat at a restaurant run by a mother and daughter. There, he recognized a robust chef called Angel, who was skilled in martial arts and once an actor in a movie fighting against villainous vampires. However, he broke his leg in the filming, becoming a chef to make a living. After finishing his meal, Gus returned home to find it reeking, his brother's corpse lying on the floor and his mutated mother hiding in a room. Upon seeing Gus, she attacked him without hesitation. Gus didn't want to fight his mother, but when the Bloodmaster mocked his failed mission and said his mother was nothing but a walking corpse, Gus couldn't bear to kill her. He grabbed some clothes and left, making sure to lock the door to prevent his mother from causing further harm. At this time, Ephraim, Fett, and Nora had just returned to their base. They planned to get some rest before heading back to the psychiatric hospital at night to observe the infection's progress. However, Fett excitedly worked on assembling bombs, while a television in the background played the news. The senator was giving a live speech, announcing a curfew and a crackdown in the Red Hook district. Peacekeeping forces would be sent to search houses and eliminate infected individuals to ensure the safety of others. Ephraim, wanting to mend his strained relationship with his son Zack, took advantage of the sunny weather and brought him to a nearby playground to practice playing ball. But Zack was not in the mood. Feeling disheartened, he remembered his mother and was excellent at playing ball. It was through her that he had come to love the sport. However, he could not see his mother at this time, and the desire to play disappeared. Meanwhile, Dutch found Abraham and informed him of the rift between Palmer and his former assistant, Fitzwilliam. After leaving the Stoneheart group, Fitzwilliam had gone to Staten Island to seek refuge with his older brother, who worked as a firefighter there. This reminded Abraham of a past event. Years ago, Palmer had asked him to find the ancient book, while he was accompanied by a bodyguard, whose last name was also Fitzwilliam. He was actually the father of the now Fitzwilliam and his brother. Abraham and Palmer had parted ways in 1996 when Abraham had found a clue to the ancient book. It had been purchased by a Hungarian in 1923 at an auction, and its whereabouts had been unknown ever since. Abraham suspected that the Hungarian had gone north, survived by assuming a false identity, and that the area had later been leveled by the Nazi Hitler. A supply train happened to leave the area at that time, and its cargo manifest indicated that it carried a religious painting, possibly the ancient book. The train's destination was a monastery at the foot of the Austrian Alps. Young Palmer decided to go and see for himself. However, when he and Abraham arrived at the monastery, they found it deserted and reeking of excrement. The library had been ransacked, as though it had just been robbed. They were too late and only encountered a terrified boy hiding in a cabinet. 
According to the boy Rudyard, the abbot believed that the ancient book was cursed and had burned it. Before Abraham could ask for more details, screams echoed through the monastery. The frightened boy quickly fled, and Abraham could only follow. But after Abraham left, Thomas appeared in front of Palmer. Thomas knew that Palmer was searching for the secret to immortality and offered to reveal all the answers once Abraham returned from dealing with the vampires. Because of that, Palmer changed his mind. He was no longer obsessed with the ancient book, but with an immortal life. Against Abraham's advice, he terminated their collaboration. As a result, Abraham's pursuit of vampires lost its funding, and he missed the opportunity to become a tenured professor. Palmer was a pure businessman, willing to betray others for his benefit. He had once broken his agreement with Abraham for Thomas, and now he could sell out others as well. Under the guise of providing financial aid, he invited banking and investment tycoons to a meeting to discuss matters. But when the conference ended and the attendees left the financial center, they were ambushed and wiped out by vampires lurking nearby. Only Palmer was allowed to leave the scene. Abraham finally found Fitzwilliam and wanted to have Fitzwilliam reveal any clues about the ancient book. However, in Fitzwilliam's memory, the book had already been burned and Palmer had given up the search. Abraham suspected that Fitzwilliam was hiding something but didn't want to force him, so he left his contact information in case Fitzwilliam changed his mind. Meanwhile, after leaving home, Gus returned to the restaurant where Angel was. Although he brought in money as a customer, he was unwelcome for being too close to the owner's daughter. Angel tried to drive Gus away, so Gus had to leave obediently. By then, it was night, and Ephraim began his observation mission. But when the group arrived at the psychiatric hospital, there were no traces of vampires. Ephraim wanted to find infected vampires nearby, but Fett didn't want to take risks, and he had more important tasks to do. So he left the truck with Ephraim and Nora and went alone to the subway station to destroy the tunnel. They split up, and Ephraim found the test subject outside the hospital, whose life was nearing its end. Ephraim decided to end the subject's suffering when he heard vampires nearby. Following the sound, he found an infected vampire's corpse on the ground. The infection seemed to be working well. Just then, more vampires jumped from the building above. Several infected vampires stood on the roof, forced to end their own lives to prevent the infection from spreading to their kind. Ephraim laughed at the success of his experiment, but was unaware that danger was approaching. Kelly's scouts, tracking Zack's scent, had entered the Red Hook district and would soon find his whereabouts. At this time, Fett had entered the subway station and installed the explosives, lighting the fuse with style. He turned to leave, but due to the curfew order, the police were guarding the subway's vicinity, revealing his presence. To buy time for the explosion, Fett had to divert the police's attention. However, after the explosion succeeded, he was arrested and sent to jail. Under the order of the senator, the Red Hook District is purged in an effort to create a plague-free zone in New York. The National Guard conducts door-to-door -door searches, carrying weapons and breaking into people's housing without mercy. They kick down residents' closed doors and apprehend people for testing. If an infected person is found, they are shot in the head. The guards are ruthless in their actions, but they still encounter resistance from skilled scouts who dodge their bullets and remain unharmed. These scouts are under Kelly's command, tracking Zack to the Red Hook District. At this moment, Ephraim enters a bar. He wants to mass-produce the anti-vampire bacteria and needs to collaborate with a pharmaceutical factory. However, with his fugitive status, it is impossible for him to establish connections in such a short time. Right then, his close friend Rob fits the bill. But Rob lives in Washington, D.C., and with New York under lockdown, Ephraim can only travel there via a government official's special train. To avoid exposing his true identity, he needs a new one. Thus, he contacts someone in the bar who sells fake IDs, buying three new documents with plans to take Nora and Zack with him. However, Zack doesn't want to leave, and Nora thinks Ephraim is being too impatient. Not to mention, they don't have a detailed plan, and leaving the city disguised as a family may attract unwanted attention. She decides to stay in New York with Zack, allowing Ephraim to act without any concerns. Just then, Dutch learns about Fett's imprisonment, so Nora goes with her to the police station to rescue him, leaving Ephraim alone. He shaves his stylish hair, then sweeps a pile of dirt in front of the door. He places the bacteria samples and dirt into an urn, bids farewell to Zack, and boards the train to Washington, D.C. After passing the ticket check at the train station, he encounters trouble on the train. He goes to the dining car to buy a drink and almost comes face to face with his former boss, Barnes. Fortunately, Barnes is busy discussing his itinerary with his assistant and doesn't notice Ephraim. He turns around and leaves. Ephraim found a compartment and pretended to chat with a familiar face. 
The stranger thought Ephraim looked familiar, as if he had seen through his disguise. After exchanging a few words, the stranger made an excuse to leave, forcing Ephraim to switch compartments once again. But just as he settled down, his former boss Barnes entered the area. With their eyes about to meet, Ephraim hurriedly slipped away and hid in the restroom of another compartment. Unexpectedly, he encountered the National Security Agency conducting compulsory quarantine checks. To avoid suspicion, he had no choice but to leave the restroom. However, after the quarantine ended, Ephraim came face to face with Barnes. But Barnes pleaded that he didn't want to serve the Bloodmaster any longer and was guilt-ridden by his former acts. He was impressed by Ephraim's plan to save the world using bioweapons and promised to let him go. But Ephraim knew Barnes was no saint and immediately overpowered him, deciding to jump off the train and escape. But upon opening the train door, he regretted his decision as the train was moving too fast. With Barnes still threatening to call the police, Ephraim quickly changed his mind, throwing Barnes off the train. As the train arrived in Washington, Barnes's assistant discovered that the newly appointed director of health had disappeared and urgently contacted the police at the station. Ephraim overheard the conversation and calmly headed for the exit. As the police searched his luggage, he lied that he was taking his wife's ashes back to her hometown for burial, successfully smuggling the bacteria sample to his friend. Meanwhile, Nora and Dutch arrived at the police station. Due to the compulsory quarantine, many people were arguing their case. It was bad enough that the individuals were being isolated. Everyone needed to work to make a living, and enforced time off meant no income. Even the senator's attempt to appease the public failed to calm their anger. Nora saw this as an opportunity. She knew a method to diagnose infections without isolation and, as a biochemist, struck a deal with the senator. If she released FET, Nora would reveal the method. Fett didn't suffer much in prison. He even had a good time with fellow inmates. However, when Dutch saw the scratches on his face, she became furious, believing he had suffered in jail. She confronted the police, but after chatting with an officer, they began discussing vampire hunting. Fett eagerly offered to help deal with the vampire scouts. He left Nora behind and followed the police to the public housing district, terminating some infected individuals wandering in the corridors. However, when they entered the room where the scouts were supposedly hiding, there was no sign of them. Instead, they found an open vent in the bathroom and heard crawling sounds from within the walls. Fett pinpointed the location by sound and stabbed a hole in the wall, drawing out the hidden infected individuals. He and Dutch then cooperated to take them down. Afterward, he pried open the elevator door in the hallway and discovered a group of infected resting inside. Dutch used the silver powder grenade, and as it exploded, all the vampires screamed in pain and died. This was far more powerful than the police's headshot strategy. On the other side, Nora used ultraviolet light to irradiate the skin, and if wriggling bloodworms were detected, it indicated an infection that required isolation. Those without signs of bloodworms were released. The senator greatly admired Nora's abilities and asked her to check a special patient for her, her nephew. The night before, her nephew had been scratched by a scout while accompanying the police guards. Although the doctors said he was fine, the senator arranged for him to be hospitalized for observation. When Nora saw the bloodworms under his skin, it confirmed that the senator had made the right decision. However, this also meant that her loved one was beyond help and had to be terminated before turning. Nora prepared a euthanasia potion, and with a single injection into the nephew, he would peacefully leave to meet Jesus. The senator couldn't bring herself to do it, so Nora had to do it for her. Nora knew the pain of losing a loved one and wanted to comfort the senator, but she didn't know how. Meanwhile, Abraham was still searching for the ancient book. He found out that a dealer named Cream had acquired a batch of old books, so he went to negotiate a deal with him alone. The man thought Abraham was weak and initially planned to rob him. However, the man was subdued by Abraham during the negotiation and had to obediently hand over the books. After flipping through all the books, Abraham didn't find the one he wanted, so he left a deposit for the man and asked him to help look for clues about the book. On his way home, Abraham encountered Fitzwilliam, who had changed his mind and decided to help Abraham against Palmer. At that time, Palmer was taking his secretary Coco out for dinner when a priest approached them, claiming to have a clue about the ancient book. He said they were waiting for a reply from an informant and asked Palmer to stay in touch if he was interested. This made Coco suspicious, thinking that her boss had a secret he couldn't reveal. Later, when they returned to the office building, Coco intentionally let down Palmer's guard by inviting him to dance. 
Just as Palmer was enchanted by Coco, a plane landed at New York's airport, which was a no-fly zone. Security immediately questioned the situation, and the pilot explained they had no choice but to land there due to a technical issue with the plane. Moreover, a passenger had become ill and disembarked, and if security wanted to question them, they could still catch up. Security quickly set out, with dogs leading the way, but they only found the wire fence cut open and no trace of the passenger. It's revealed that this passenger was incredibly agile. Wearing a helmet and carrying a treasured sword, it was none other than Mr. Quinlan, an elite vampire and the one who created the Vaughn's hunting team. With the help of humans, Mr. Quinlan easily entered Manhattan and went to talk to the three vampire ancestors there, mocking their incompetence. He said they should have taken action seven centuries ago, and now they were anxious about the Bloodmaster causing trouble and losing Vaughn. The three vampire ancestors promised to cooperate fully with Mr. Quinlan. He sensed that the Bloodmaster was injured, but didn't know the details, so he wanted to talk to Abraham and the others. However, they still needed the help of the human hunter, Gus. At this moment, Gus was pestering Angel in the restaurant, saying that he admired Angel's acting, but Angel kept ignoring him. The shop owner asked his daughter to deliver some takeout. It was dangerous outside with vampires lurking in the housing complex. The girl was too scared to go alone and tried to persuade her father to give up on this order. However, her father thought it was time for her to contribute to the family, so she reluctantly agreed. Seeing her fear, Gus offered to accompany and protect her. Angel didn't want the girl to be in the company of someone like Gus, who had served time in prison and was a well-known small-time criminal. Worried that Gus might harm the girl, Angel decided to join them as a protector. They walked to the delivery destination and successfully handed over the order. As they were leaving, two wandering infected appeared in the corridor. Gus easily resolved the situation with a single silver axe, saving Angel who was struggling with his leg injury. Meanwhile, Ephraim finally met with his friend Rob. He explained the situation in New York and asked for Rob's help to contact a pharmaceutical factory to manufacture a counteragent and then contact the Department of Defense to spread it, waging biochemical warfare against the vampires. Rob fully supported Ephraim but couldn't involve the Department of Defense. However, he knew the head of the National Guard and could help persuade him. Rob also had a contact at the pharmaceutical factory, a woman who was the factory's representative there. He immediately arranged a meeting with her. Ephraim presented some slides showing the effects of the infection. The representative was amazed, and when she heard that three million people could be infected, she saw it as a golden opportunity for fame and fortune. She called the research center director, and while they were waiting for a response, the three of them went to a bar to chat. Ephraim shared his experiences as a doctor abroad, captivating the representative. She became smitten with this man, despite not knowing his true identity. When the biopharmaceutical department decided to manufacture the infection, Rob found an excuse to leave, leaving the representative and Ephraim alone. The two naturally ended up in bed. However, after a hormone night, the representative asked Ephraim to sign a contract granting the pharmaceutical factory exclusive operating rights and product ownership. This was clearly war profiteering. Ephraim felt that the factory shouldn't be so greedy at this time, and the representative shouldn't have slept with him just for a contract. But he was helpless, so even though he felt used, he reluctantly signed the contract. Afterward, Ephraim had to go to meet with the head of the National Guard. The commander was initially unwilling to get involved in biochemical warfare. Instead, he recommended a large company with a military background, the Stoneheart Group, led by Palmer. Ephraim rejected this suggestion, stating that any private enterprise would be acceptable except for Stoneheart. Rob chimed in, emphasizing that this was a matter of national importance. The commander valued Rob's opinion and agreed to help. At the same time, the pharmaceutical factory was working around the clock on tests and would have results within 72 hours. Once approved, production could begin immediately. Ephraim wanted to share this good news with Rob, but he couldn't reach him on the phone and no one seemed to be at his home. The representative took advantage of the time alone with Ephraim to reveal her true feelings. She said she hadn't used him and just followed the rules for the sake of their goal. Ephraim forgave the representative and even planned to spend the night with her. However, when the two entered Rob's bedroom, they discovered he had been shot in the head, his lifeless body on the floor. The killer emerged from the shadows, and Ephraim realized he was the target. The assassin killed the representative and tried to attack Ephraim, but he killed the attacker instead. From the assassin's phone, Ephraim learned that Palmer was the one pulling the strings. Meanwhile, Abraham was still studying Palmer's movements. 
Fitzwilliam knew that his former boss Palmer had purchased a lot of industrial property in New York. His construction team had built secret prisons for the U.S. military, and it seemed they were plotting something again. However, Fitzwilliam didn't know more details. At this time, Abraham received a call from Nora, who said she was in trouble. It turns out, to make Zack happy, she had used her connections with the senator to take him to a police station to pick out supplies. On their way back, they were attacked by scouts led by Kelly. Nora and Zack could only hide in a nearby church and call Abraham for help. The church could keep Kelly at bay, but it was useless against the wall-climbing scouts. They broke the glass to enter the church, opened the door for Kelly, and located Zack's hiding place by scent. However, when Kelly followed the scent, she only found Zack's scarf. Nora had already taken him outside, hiding elsewhere to buy time. They were eventually discovered, and just in time, Abraham and the other two arrived, armed with silver bullet handguns. They fired at the scouts, who were frightened and scattered. However, after Nora killed a scout, Fitzwilliam was hit in the leg by another. Even though Abraham beheaded the attacker and Kelly was chased away by Fett, Fitzwilliam's life was coming to an end. He didn't want to turn into a vampire, so he asked Abraham to grant him a mercy killing and send him to meet Jesus. At the same time, Palmer approached Thomas again, proposing a meeting with the Bloodmaster. He claimed that the plan was moving on to the next phase, and only a face-to-face -face meeting could ensure its success. In reality, he was trying to determine if the Bloodmaster was injured, but Thomas refused him. After dealing with Palmer, he led Bolivar into the basement, claiming that the Great Transformation was about to happen. The Bloodmaster's custom-made coffin was stored there, and his weak body lay within it, getting healed from the soil. As Thomas approached, determined to offer his body as a vessel for the Master, the latter chose Bolivar instead. Just like when he occupied Sardu's body, the Bloodmaster's essence entered Bolivar, transferring his soul as well. Sardu's body collapsed like a patient curled up on the floor. Thomas held the lifeless body and cried, thinking he should be the chosen one. But the grieving Thomas was quickly mind-controlled by the Bloodmaster. Thomas then swore allegiance to his master, who now wore Bolivar's skin and vowed to follow him as always. The scene shifts to Palmer staring at his secretary Coco, like a hunter who had fallen in love with his prey. But his subordinates suddenly entered and brought news from Washington. They had intercepted Ephraim's plan, and Palmer's allies controlled the biochemical weapon. They had also killed the relevant informants, but Ephraim had escaped and vanished. In reality, he had already returned to New York but was discovered injured by Nora. He treated his wounds with alcohol, then endured the pain, and went to a bar to drown his sorrows for his failure. When a drunken Ephraim returned to the base, he found a strange woman in his home. It was Nikki who had previously stolen Dutch's belongings. After a night of passion with Fett, Dutch went back to her own house to get a change of clothes. This made Fett regretful. He discovered that Dutch's door was locked from the inside, meaning someone had broken into her home. Fett kicked the door open and found a woman hiding in a closet, her eyes filled with tears of fear. Dutch recognized her as Nikki, her long-lost friend, and gave her a hug to celebrate their reunion. Once Nikki had calmed down, she recounted her experiences since fleeing the gas station. She had twisted her ankle on the way and should have gone to the hospital, but she was too scared to wander around and had sought refuge in Dutch's house. Dutch, not holding any grudges, was happy that Nikki was alive. This upset Fett, who urged Dutch to return to the base with her belongings. Unexpectedly, Dutch brought Nikki along. Back at the base, Fett talked privately with Dutch, asking her to think about Nikki's actions. Dutch, however, believed Nikki had suffered and was mentally unstable. She refused to tell Nikki about her relationship with Fett and even canceled her plans with Abraham to stay home with Nikki. Nikki sensed the unusual relationship between Dutch and Fett, but when she tried to pry further, the atmosphere grew awkward. Just then, Ephraim returned, reeking of alcohol. He didn't like Nikki either and even gave her a nickname. At this time, Fett and Abraham were outside taking care of business. Before his death, Fitzwilliam had left them the address of Palmer's properties. Abraham found one of the factories suspicious, so they cut through the fence and sneaked in. They discovered the blind school bus, but their whereabouts were also being monitored. Just as the observer was about to report, he was suddenly taken out by Quinlan, who appeared from behind. Relying on their previous experience, Abraham and Fett went straight into the factory basement, and sure enough, they found traces of the Bloodmaster's presence. In a concrete pool filled with soil, they found two scouts with broken necks. But then, several agile scouts rushed out from the darkness to interfere. Their movements were swift, making it impossible for Fett to aim. Just as he prepared for a desperate fight, the scouts retreated back into the darkness, as if they sensed a more powerful creature approaching. 
Abraham was puzzled and then saw Quinlan standing on the stairs. Quinlan quickly took care of the attacking scouts. In Abraham's possession was an ancient book that documented Quinlan's origins. He was a half-blood from ancient Rome, possessing a human body but carrying the blood of the vampire strain Strigoi, allowing him to walk in sunlight like a normal person. At that time, Roman nobles wanted to capture Quinlan, but their armies were always defeated in the process. Eventually, Quinlan decided to learn human nature and behavior and pretended to be captured, becoming an invincible gladiator in the arena. A council member with some knowledge of dark magic saw his abilities and offered him a chance to learn and train. From then on, Quinlan became a warrior of the Roman Empire. However, since Quinlan embarked on the path of hunting the Bloodmaster, the Roman Empire also perished. In 1873, he pursued the Bloodmaster to Albania, which was no longer as prosperous as it once was. Since the Bloodmaster had occupied Sardu's colossal body, he had been eating recklessly. The number of monsters in the town kept increasing, and eventually there were even cases of human-to-human -human infections. The locals thought their town was cursed, and all healthy residents fled. When Quinlan arrived, there were few living people left. Naturally, the Bloodmaster had also escaped, leaving behind a wolf-headed cane in the underground tunnel of Sardu's castle and a few walking corpses to mock Quinlan. Now, this was the first time Abraham had met Quinlan. He believed Quinlan was on their side. He also learned from Quinlan that the Bloodmaster had changed his vessel, but Quinlan slipped away halfway through his explanation, leaving only a statement that this place was the Bloodmaster's lair, indicating that the Bloodmaster was hiding here. So Abraham instructed Fett to demolish the factory. However, while Fett was setting up explosives, Abraham searched for the Bloodmaster's location. He later found Sardu's stiff body in a tunnel. Quinlan was also searching for the Bloodmaster and saw him before Abraham did. He immediately mocked the Bloodmaster for choosing poor skin and boasted that he could finish him off in seconds. However, Quinlan hesitated to attack, and when Abraham arrived, the two were still trading verbal jabs. The Bloodmaster then mentioned Quinlan's deceased mother, causing Quinlan to go berserk. But Fett had just detonated the bomb, and the Bloodmaster and Thomas took the opportunity to escape amidst the explosion. Quinlan had missed his chance to kill the Bloodmaster. He believed this was due to Abraham's operational mistake and declared that this was his fight and that he would take over. He then left in a hurry. By the time the two returned to the base, Ephraim had already learned about Kelly's situation from Nora. When Ephraim tried to comfort his son, Zack wasn't afraid. The boy believed that the monster leading the scouts was his mother, Kelly. Fett had just returned to find Nikki and Dutch's loving scene, feeling mixed emotions. He then went to the bar across the street to drown his sorrows. Ephraim joined him, sharing his plan to assassinate Palmer. Considering Fett's previous failed infiltration of the Stoneheart Group building, Ephraim guessed that security would be tight, so he wanted to use a sniper rifle. But there wasn't one at the base, so they had to buy one outside. Fett always had explosives on hand and clearly had suppliers. Under Ephraim's questioning, he provided a weapons supplier. The next day, Ephraim decided to take his son to buy the weapons, but they woke up Nora in the process. Nora, having learned about Barnes's death from the news, asked Ephraim if he knew anything about it. Ephraim denied any knowledge, urging her not to spread rumors. Then he left with his son. Zack had another dream about his mother, smiling as he recounted the dream's content. Ephraim reminded him that Kelly had become a monster. By this time, they had arrived at the supplier's shop, which seemed to have recently been robbed. There was a pool of wet blood on the floor. The shop owner's daughter came out, holding a gun, leaving Ephraim at a loss. However, Zack cleverly mentioned that his father was a doctor who could help save lives. The shop owner had been shot in the abdomen and needed immediate surgery to avoid bleeding to death. Ephraim then used his medical skills to stitch up the wound and even stealthily took a bottle of painkillers. The grateful shop owner gave him a sniper rifle. However, after seeing his father's surgery, Zack believed that he could replicate the process to save his mother or at least talk to her. That opportunity would come soon. Kelly, after being severely injured last time, returned to the Red Hook District. To increase her chances of success, Thomas taught her how to use makeup to disguise herself and visit Zack in her former appearance. As Kelly drove past a checkpoint, she encountered a routine inspection by the National Guard, who used ultraviolet light on her skin. Although she appeared normal on the surface, her physical constitution hadn't changed, and she was hiding several young scouts in her trunk. 
Just as she was about to be exposed, a group of vampires suddenly emerged from the car behind her, attacking passers-by with their tendrils. Chaos ensued, allowing Kelly to slip through the checkpoint and hide in a factory garage to wait for nightfall. Meanwhile, Palmer was indulging in the pleasures of his secretary, Coco, who had reciprocated his feelings. Coco thought they had grown close and questioned Palmer about the ancient book and Thomas, but Palmer refused to discuss the matter. Soon after, a cardinal came to Palmer with news of a lead on the ancient book, a mysterious seller willing to part with his precious collection for a high price. Palmer offered a price, but the cardinal held back, mentioning other bidders. One such bidder was Abraham, who was so poor that he lived off pawn shops. Even though the cardinal knew Abraham had no money, he didn't want to make a deal with Palmer right away, and left abruptly when Thomas arrived, hoping to inflate the price. Thomas was furious upon hearing their conversation. He reminded Palmer that the bloodmaster had dissuaded him from seeking the ancient book. Thomas then demanded that Palmer repair the destroyed factory within a week, Palmer was infuriated, feeling that Thomas was pushing him too far. Learning that Bolivar had become the blood master's vessel, Palmer scoffed and mocked him. On the other hand, Abraham and Fett approached the cardinal, claiming that a wealthy man wanted to buy the ancient book and had enough money to meet any asking price. The cardinal demanded a high price, which Abraham agreed to without hesitation, promising to deliver the money within 24 hours. The cardinal, however, didn't agree on the spot, telling Abraham to wait for news at home. Abraham guessed that Palmer was also bidding, and warned the cardinal against doing business with such a person, fearing he might be double-crossed. The cardinal ignored the advice and sent him away. Once outside, the silent Fett asked Abraham how they would raise such a large sum, as even selling their property wouldn't be enough. Abraham played a trick this time. It turns out that he never intended to spend money on the book, he just wanted to make sure the cardinal had it in his possession. If the book was indeed with the Cardinal and Palmer knew about it, Palmer would definitely send someone to steal it. To prevent any unexpected event, Abraham decided to take the book first. At the same time, there was something unusual happening with Gus. During the day, he went with Angel to pick up supplies from the supplier. He thought it would be smooth sailing, but the supplier's warehouse was robbed. Angel felt that New York would become more chaotic, so he returned to the restaurant and advised the boss to pack up and escape. At first, the boss didn't agree, as there was a quarantine order outside, and without proper documents, one couldn't leave. Gus said this wouldn't be a problem, as he was well-versed in smuggling details. So under the persuasion of his wife, the boss decided to abandon the restaurant. The boss's daughter was grateful for Gus's help. She hoped that Gus would go with them. However, when Gus agreed, Mr. Quinlan came to break up the couple, revealing his identity and asking Gus to help him. Gus didn't want to agree to Mr. Quinlan at first, but when he thought of the Bloodmaster's devastation to his family, he decided to eliminate the Bloodmaster with Mr. Quinlan, solving the current dilemma at its root. Later at night, Thomas visited the Cardinal, wanting him to hand over the book. Unexpectedly, the Cardinal raised his price again, demanding one million U.S. dollars. Thomas, on the other hand, wanted to exchange the book for his life. By the time Abraham and Fett sneaked into the church, the stubborn cardinal had been infected by the bloodworms. Before his death, he claimed to be just a middleman and refused to reveal his employer. However, when the cardinal turned into a vampire, his secrets would be spied upon by the bloodmaster, and he would betray his employer and the god he had always believed in. After Abraham and Fett drove Thomas away, they gave the cardinal a new choice. As long as he revealed the name of the book's holder, Abraham could save his soul. However, the method was to behead the cardinal with a single stroke. The name the cardinal gave was very familiar to Abraham. It was the little boy Rudyard he met in the monastery back then. The cardinal's death was quickly reported by the TV station, and Palmer learned of his death. Coco was visibly upset and wanted to face the current difficulties with him, but Palmer didn't want to involve her. He couldn't tell her outright, which made her angry. She stormed off, leaving Palmer dumbfounded. At the same time, Ephraim and his son returned to their base. Zack was upset and argued about Kelly's situation on the way home. When they got home, he settled on the couch to play video games. Ephraim talked to Nora about the situation and wanted to discuss how to deal with Zack. But Nora changed the subject, saying that Ephraim hid something from her, discovering that he had a sniper rifle. Ephraim had no choice but to tell her about killing Barnes. While the two were chatting, a figure outside was searching for Zack. 
It was Kelly who had already disguised herself. She initially wanted to enter directly, but the door was locked from the inside, so she had to knock on the window to attract Zack's attention and coax him into opening the door. By the time Ephraim heard the voices downstairs, Zack had already opened the door and Kelly barged in. Fortunately, Nora shot in time, preventing Kelly from taking Zack away. However, Kelly didn't give up, using her words to confuse Zack and Ephraim and sending in scouts to besiege them. The space was too cramped for them, and the scouts couldn't fully utilize their abilities. Two of them were taken down, and Kelly was injured by Nora. Realizing she was at a disadvantage, Kelly had no choice but to escape. The scene shifts to a ship that was docked at the pier in the early morning. The crew member had just returned and found a stranger sitting on the deck. It's Thomas, the loyal servant of the Bloodmaster. He knew that Kelly's attack on Ephraim's base had failed and wanted to find another way into the Red Hook District. The quarantine station had UV lights working around the clock, and the Red Hook District was surrounded by water on three sides. Although one side had a tunnel, it had been destroyed by Fett, so Thomas had to take a boat across the river. To gain the crew member's trust, he offered a bundle of cash as a deposit, promising even more generous rewards if he could transport 20 people to the other side. With the money, the crew member was willing to take the risk and help with smuggling. Meanwhile, Abraham was still lecturing Zack, explaining the methods of vampires in detail. However, Zack remained stubborn, believing he had done nothing wrong. Abraham didn't care what he thought. Since Kelly had found their base, the Bloodmaster must also be aware of its location and would likely send more powerful attackers. To protect the base, Fett reinforced all the doors and windows. Ephraim wanted to seek external help, and it happened that the Senator was still in the Red Hook district. With Nora's good relationship with her, they might be able to convince her to offer some help because they still needed more firepower to deal with the vampire army. They had no choice but to cooperate with the senator. Before meeting her, Fett wanted to talk to Dutch, who had recently moved out with Nikki. Nora accompanied him, while Abraham went with Ephraim and his son to meet the senator. At this moment, Dutch was busy welding a fence at home, a skill she had learned from Fett. Nikki watched, feeling uncomfortable. Just then, a knock on the door interrupted them. Fett entered and got straight to the point, asking Dutch to go with him to the senators. Dutch didn't want to ruin their relationship, so she asked Fett to wait outside while she discussed the matter privately with Nikki. On the other side of town, Abraham borrowed a sniper rifle from Ephraim, knowing it wasn't from their base. However, he didn't ask about its origin, and simply reminded Ephraim to maintain his sanity, even when dealing with evil people, and not to be blinded by hatred. When they finally located the senator, she was explaining the Red Hook District's deployment to the mayor, who seemed uninterested. Instead, he suggested that she lead an offensive into the heavily afflicted Manhattan district, where thousands of vampires resided in the tunnels. The mayor didn't consider the vampire threat, but the valuable real estate in Manhattan. The senator saw through the mayor's intentions, realizing he wanted to save his wealthy friends. They began to argue, and at that moment, Ephraim and Abraham burst in, only to be chased out by the National Guard. Abraham had spoken the truth, saying that the Bloodmaster would send a vampire army to attack Red Hook that night, but no one believed him. Night had fallen in New York. The vampires crossed the river by boat and landed ashore. Thomas paid the boatman his remaining fee, allowing him to experience the pain of the tendril. Thomas then led his zombie-like men towards the power plant, forcing an on-duty worker to cut off electricity to Red Hook. Just before the villains arrived, Dutch and Nikki were still confronting each other. Dutch questioned why Nikki hadn't encountered the infected drug users while waiting at her home, and wondered why her money was missing if only her laptop had been thrown away. Under Dutch's questioning, Nikki quickly changed the subject. Their conversation was interrupted when they ended up doing hormone therapy on the bed. Meanwhile, Ephraim and the others were discussing strategies on the street, planning to wait for Nora before trying to convince the senator again. Suddenly, all the lights around them went off, including the ultraviolet lamps at the quarantine station. Abraham had seen this tactic before. Seeing the senator come outside to assess the situation, he and Ephraim hurriedly warned her to prepare for a direct attack because they lost the ultraviolet lights. Upon hearing this, the mayor quickly got in his car and left. Though the senator was panicked, she remained resolute and prepared to fight. Immediately, she took Abraham and two others to the quarantine checkpoint. The captain of the National Guard had already been waiting there. The senator took a gun from him and hastily learned how to use it. Meanwhile, Nora and Fett arrived as well. They threw flares towards the quarantine station, and upon seeing the attacking vampires, the captain ordered to open fire. The real battle had begun. In an instant, all guns fired outwards, immediately eliminating the vampires trying to break through the wire fence. 
However, after a brief ceasefire, Abraham reminded the senator that the initial attack was just a test of their defenses. More vampires would approach, and the only way out was to restore power to the electric plant and use ultraviolet light in combat. The National Guard didn't have enough forces, so Ephraim and his team had to deal with it. Abraham didn't want to waste time on this, as he sought to return to the base and kill Thomas, which was a rare opportunity. Although Ephraim was worried about Abraham acting alone, his primary task was to restore power. He promised to return as soon as the power was restored. While they split into two groups, Dutch found out about the power outage and the gunfire outside. She quickly got dressed and went out to fight. Before leaving, she even gave Nikki a short sword for self-defense. At the same time, the senator heard the low growls of the vampires, thinking they were calling their kind like wild animals. She climbed up and observed with binoculars, only to find that the front was filled with tendril monsters. She collapsed by the sight, believing that continuing to fight would be suicidal. But the captain calmed her down. Relying on the current forces, it was impossible to win this battle. She had to call for more people to join the fight. The senator took a police car and gave speeches in the streets and alleys, asking the residents of Red Hook to defend their homes together. Dutch heard the broadcast and followed the senator back to the quarantine station. However, the vampire army had mobilized. They used human shields and broke through the quarantine station's wire fence under gunfire, engaging in a melee with the incoming residents. Although Dutch knew how to deal with the vampires, she struggled against their numbers and was almost hit by a tendril. In the end, it was Nikki who followed her and saved her. Inside the power plant, Ephraim's team had already infiltrated. They dealt with infected people along the way, but one of them seemed to be undead, staring at Zack, obviously being observed by the Blood Master. Kelly then knew Zack's location. However, before she arrived at the power plant, Nora managed to restore the power. After Fett's operations, they finally repaired the power equipment. The ultraviolet lights were turned on simultaneously, catching the invading vampires off guard. All of them died under the ultraviolet light. The midnight battle against the vampires was finally over. Ephraim went to the base to help Abraham, leaving his son to be taken care of by Nora. Unexpectedly, Kelly managed to pinpoint their location. Fett tried to lead Kelly away by making a diversion, but she outsmarted them, snatching Fett's gun and shooting Zack. Fortunately, the nearby National Guard arrived in time, forcing Kelly to flee in haste. Elsewhere, Thomas wanted to go to the base to deal with Abraham, but the Bloodmaster didn't allow the killing. Thomas could only think of ways to torture him. Unbeknownst to him, as he entered the base through the open door and looked at Miriam's photo, Abraham had been waiting outside for a long time. Abraham mocked him and challenged him. Meanwhile, Ephraim fired two shots from upstairs, both of which were detected and easily dodged by Thomas. Abraham tried to fight with his sword, but he was easily knocked down. Then Thomas went upstairs to chase Ephraim. Since he wasn't allowed to kill Abraham, dealing with Ephraim would be an easy job for him. Ephraim could only flee between floors. However, the vampire's sense of smell and hearing are quite sharp. They can hear the sound of a human pulse and smell the sweaty odor of the human body. Ephraim was chased all the way to the rooftop, and when he had nowhere left to retreat, two gunshots suddenly rang, both striking the arrogant Thomas. It turned out that Abraham had climbed to the rooftop alone to ambush Thomas during the chase. Hit by silver bullets, his power greatly diminished, and he fled in panic, jumping from the building and hastily escaping. The next day, the senator organized people to collect the remains. Ephraim and his group gathered together, happy that everyone had survived. However, Ephraim still wanted to assassinate Palmer after returning from Washington, but never found the right opportunity. He asked the hacker Dutch to install a device for remote monitoring of Palmer. This device was actually a laser sensor that could capture Palmer's voice as he spoke. Palmer was not in his office at the time. So after setting up the device, Dutch chatted with Ephraim about her feelings for two people at the same time, not wanting to give up on Fett and Nikki, but feeling selfish and like she was betraying someone. She asked the experienced Ephraim for advice on how he had resisted Nora's charm before divorcing Kelly. Ephraim thought Dutch was simply avoiding the issue and should find an opportunity to talk to Fett and Nikki, letting them make the choice. Just then, Palmer's voice came through the device, and looking through binoculars, they found he was trying to comfort his secretary. It turned out that Coco had not been to work since arguing with Palmer, and for the first time, Palmer felt his love for Coco. He had to visit and ask for forgiveness, speaking heartfelt words. Although Coco kept a straight face, she still returned to work. However, just as Palmer invited her to dinner, someone burst in, causing a commotion. 
It was the panicked mayor of New York who had previously ordered the senator to clean up the vampires in Manhattan, thinking it would be a good way to win the rich people's votes. He even prepared a press conference. But to his surprise, the senator happily took the stage, demanding more property tax on the wealthy area, or else she wouldn't launch the safety plan in Manhattan. After all, the citizens of the Red Hook District had fought the monsters and paid with their blood. The mayor was humiliated. He had no choice but to turn to Palmer for help, asking him to persuade the senator. Palmer couldn't refuse the mayor's request, so he asked Coco to prepare the car and notify the media, planning to visit the senator at 3 p.m. This was a good opportunity for Ephraim, as he could find a good point for sniping beforehand. On the other side, Fett and Nora couldn't refuse Abraham's request to help him find the ancient book. However, Abraham only had a name to go on. They checked the district's registry and found that there were four or five people with the same name. They had no choice but to visit each family one by one. The first house they went to belonged to a punk man who had been infected. Abraham quickly decapitated him with a sword, then checked his ID photo and realized that the ages didn't match up. He had seen Rudyard as a child in the monastery 40 years ago, and Rudyard should be a grown man by now. The second house belonged to a bookstore owner. Before seeing the bookstore owner, Abraham asked Nora and Fett to help him look for the ancient book, even though there were thousands in the store. Fortunately, the ancient book had a silver-plated cover, making it easier to find. But before the trio could go through all the books, they were shocked to learn that Ephraim and Dutch had been arrested and imprisoned. It turned out that Ephraim and Dutch had arrived at their sniping position 15 minutes early and had found a good escape route. However, due to Ephraim's poor shooting skills, he couldn't aim properly at Palmer when he appeared. After hesitating for a while, he finally saw an opportunity and fired a shot. But Palmer was immediately tackled to the ground by his bodyguards, but there was a splash of blood on the glass. As the guards were now in pursuit, the two of them had to run away. Although they disguised themselves as a couple to blend into the crowd, they were exposed and surrounded by the police. However, the person who was truly hurt was not Palmer, but his beloved secretary, Coco. This news quickly spread through the media. Nora and Fett abandoned Abraham and rushed to their rescue. Abraham was left to continue searching for the book, almost being attacked by an infected person from behind. After narrowly dealing with the threat, he checked the left ear of the deceased and found it intact, concluding that this person was not Rudyard. Actually, when Abraham discovered Rudyard years ago, he noticed his left ear was deformed due to a burn. After the search, Abraham had to visit the next house. On another note, Palmer sought the best doctor to treat Coco, but she remained unconscious. He could only turn to Thomas, asking to meet the Bloodmaster and request their help in saving Coco. If she couldn't be saved, Palmer threatened to quit, rendering all of their previous efforts futile. Thomas had never seen him so irrational, so he agreed to convey the message. While waiting for a response, there was an incident at the police detention center. A police officer took Dutch away, leaving Ephraim alone in a cage. He didn't know what was happening until he saw Palmer, who must have used his wealth and power to arrange a conversation. In extreme anger, Palmer accused Ephraim of killing an innocent woman and urged him to stop being stubborn as the situation was already beyond their control. However, Ephraim didn't regret shooting and instead called Palmer a puppet of the Bloodmaster. These words shook Palmer, but when the Bloodmaster appeared at Coco's bedside and used two drops of blood to save her life, the love-stricken tycoon regained his loyalty, praising the Bloodmaster's abilities in front of Coco, which only confused Coco much more. At this time, there was chaos at the police station. When the Bloodmaster learned of Ephraim's actions, he sent people to silence them. They quickly dealt with the police officers and attacked Ephraim from a distance with their tendrils. However, they always missed him by an inch. By the time Fett and Nora arrived, they effortlessly dealt with all the infected. But after Ephraim was saved, Fett couldn't find Dutch. They only learned from a surviving police officer that a colleague had taken her to a hotel on orders. At this moment, Dutch was filled with horror at the hotel. Her neck was locked with an iron chain, and someone was pulling the chain towards a room, which seems like the place where Thomas fed on humans. Meanwhile, Abraham finally found the ancient book they wanted. But as he flipped through a few pages, someone knocked him out from behind and took the ancient book. The scene then shifts to Dutch, who was chained and sat shivering. Her eyes stared at the closed door, which was then opened from the outside. Thomas dragged a police officer inside and poured a bottle of gin down his throat, seasoning the food at hand. Then he ate in front of Dutch and finally snapped the officer's neck. The scene terrified Dutch. Just as she thought her life would end here, Thomas didn't attack her. 
Instead, she said that Dutch's shampoo scent reminded him of a perfume that came from a woman. In 1931, the Great Depression swept through Europe and many workers were forced to be unemployed. At the time, Thomas was a salesperson selling radios door to door. This luxury item could only be purchased by ordinary families through installment payments. Thomas's business was repeatedly frustrated and he became the laughingstock of his colleagues. Only the co-worker Helga was nice to him. Helga was beautiful and gentle, which made Thomas fall in love with her, inviting her to dinner on Saturday. Helga also had some feelings for Thomas and happily accepted the invitation. However, during their sweet date, a German officer appeared. He stood in the center of the crowd, calling for Germans to join the army and build their empire. Thomas was fired up by his words. Later, while walking with Helga, he couldn't stop bad-mouthing Jews for ruining Germany's economy. But he forgot that Helga was also Jewish. When he realized his mistake, he tried to defend her identity, saying that she was different from other Jews because she was a German Jew. This made Helga even angrier, and they went their separate ways. Thomas's love affair ended before it even began. Later, as Jews faced persecution, Helga and her family were to be expelled from the country. They had no choice but to seek help from Lieutenant Thomas, who was thriving in the army. To her surprise, when Thomas saw her, he didn't want to be suspected by his superiors. Although admitting that they used to be colleagues, Thomas slandered Helga for stealing. Then, as Helga cried helplessly, he laughed and left the room, not feeling sad about her ordeal. As he walked down the street lighting up a cigarette, he enjoyed the respect from passers-by, a smug grin on his face. But just around the corner, he saw Helga again, the one he had admired. She was now a cold corpse, hanging from a wooden frame by a rope. Even though Thomas had since become a vampire and lost a part of his body, he still harbored lust for Helga. So when he saw Dutch that looked like Helga, he planned to force his vampire hormones on her. Taking the chance, she took a can of anti-hormone spray from a dead officer. As Thomas ordered her to undress and prepared to use his tendril tongue to massage her, Dutch unexpectedly sprayed the repellent in his face, unlocked her shackles with the keys, and quickly fled. However, once outside, she realized it was just a series of hotel rooms. The elevator doors were all sealed with bricks. At this time, Ephraim and his team were trying to save Dutch. From the police, they learned of the old-fashioned hotel built in the last century, located next to the National Guard headquarters in Manhattan. They found a police car nearby with one of Dutch's clothes, indicating she might have been here. Pet guessed their destination was inside the hotel. The building had twin towers, but while the right side was brightly lit, the left side was pitch black. Fett then thought of an entrance. When Roosevelt came to New York for a meeting, the hotel built a secret passage exclusively for him. So the three of them found the passage, but as they entered, Thomas had already begun his pursuit, and Dutch could only run down the escalator. When she reached the bottom, she found there was a dead end. Despair and fear caused Dutch to cry out, but Thomas grew excited from her despair. He grabbed her leg, dragging her sexy body back to the room. Meanwhile, Fett heard her cries for help and used a steel bar to chisel a hole in the wall, then stuffed a bomb inside. After the explosion, the three rushed over, and just as Thomas was about to drag Dutch away, Fett threw a silver bomb. Thomas was terrified of this, so he quickly let go and fled. Dutch jumped into Fett's arms. She was finally saved. Nora and Ephraim couldn't find Thomas, so they brought Dutch back to their base. On the way, they didn't dare ask Dutch what she had experienced. They just listened to the girl sobbing in Fett's comforting embrace. On the other side, Abraham was tied up, sitting in a chair with his hands and feet bound. A middle-aged man aimed a gun at him. Abraham noticed the burn on the man's ear and guessed that this was the little boy from the monastery years ago. Abraham tried to appeal to the man's emotions, reminding him that he had saved his life back then. The man named Rudyard was a bit taken aback but eventually recalled the past. He agreed not to kill Abraham, but he refused to give him the ancient book, even if it could save humanity. No matter how high the price Abraham offered, Rudyard wouldn't sell it, especially since he already found a buyer. Ignoring Abraham's cries, Rudyard left the room with the book. By the time Abraham freed himself and retrieved his silver sword, Rudyard had long disappeared. At the same time, Gus was bidding farewell to the shop owner's daughter. They didn't confess their love in words, but they couldn't help but ignite their hormone ship. Gus had made a deal with Mr. Quinlan. He would help the vampire ancestors fight in exchange for ensuring the shop owner's family could leave New York. Their departure was scheduled for that night. Gus escorted them to the quarantine exit, where a well-dressed woman handed them their passes. 
Angel was supposed to leave too, but changed his mind at the last moment, deciding to stay and fight alongside Gus to save New York. They both got into the woman's car and headed to report to Mr. Quinlan. The next day, Rudyard took a taxi to Roosevelt Island. The place was heavily guarded, with armed guards everywhere. Their boss turned out to be the dealer Cream. It turns out the Cardinal had advised Rudyard not to hold an auction to sell the book and instead to use it to exchange for a pass out of New York and funds for retirement. Cream, previously commissioned by Abraham, had been searching for the ancient book and readily agreed to the deal when Rudyard brought the book to him. Meanwhile, Fett came to check on Dutch, as warm and caring as a new boyfriend. However, what followed left him disheartened. Dutch didn't want to hold Fett back, so she decided to be with Nikki. Fett didn't resent Dutch, but instead supported her pursuit of true love. When Dutch went to see Nikki, she found her and her mother packing up, having received documents to leave the city. They planned to leave New York that day. If Dutch hadn't arrived just in time, she would have been kept in the dark. Previously, Dutch had helped Ephraim deal with Palmer and left a message for Nikki, leaving her alone in the rental house. Unable to bear the long wait and convinced by her mother, Nikki decided to break up with Dutch. She didn't want to get involved in the vampire battle. Ephraim also made his own choice. In 2005, he met Nora at a conference on infectious diseases. Impressed by her skills as a biochemist, Ephraim invited her to join the Canary Project. Nora saw it as an opportunity and agreed. At that time, he worried that his wife Kelly would become jealous of Nora's beauty when they became colleagues. After all, Ephraim's marriage was on the rocks, and Kelly always wanted him to quit his job at the CDC and take a stable office job so he could spend more time with his family. Despite Kelly's wishes, Ephraim did not leave his job. Instead, he worked with Nora for eight years until a team gathering in 2013. It was that night, under the influence of alcohol, that Ephraim revealed to Nora that Kelly had filed for divorce and wanted custody of their son, Zach. Nora knew she was partly to blame, as feelings had grown between her and Ephraim, though they never acted on them. That night, they crossed the line between colleagues and lovers. Even when Ephraim's divorce was finalized and the bloodthirsty pathogen broke out in New York, they remained on-again, off-again lovers. Now, after witnessing Dutch's situation the previous night, Ephraim decided to confront his feelings and confess to Nora. When he learned that Kelly's parents were still alive, Ephraim chose to send Zack to live with them, while he would stay on the battlefield, using bioweapons to resolve New York's crisis. However, with his current status, he couldn't obtain a pass to leave the city and needed the help of the senator. The senator had her own pile of problems, always at odds with the mayor and imposing property taxes on the wealthy. The mayor gave her two choices, resign voluntarily or face charges that would force her out. The senator told him to call the district attorney's office and said she wouldn't back down. She then intended to ask the National Guard captain for help, but before she could, she was stopped by a detective from the New York Police Department who claimed that the mayor had been murdered at his home and that she was a suspect due to their ongoing conflicts. The senator insisted she was innocent, arguing that she had known the mayor for 20 years and would have acted sooner if she wanted to harm him. After the detective left, she suspected the captain might be involved, but he was just as confused and promised to find the truth. Just then, Palmer appeared at the crime scene not to mourn the mayor, but to strike a deal with the senator. He would use his resources to secure a new position for her, responsible for commanding the city's fight against the plague. In exchange, she would represent the government in purchasing weapons from Palmer's Stoneheart Group at exorbitant prices. Though the senator despised Palmer's business tactics, she had no choice but to cooperate. After a vote from the city council, she assumed her new position with more powers. When Ephraim and Nora arrived to explain their plan to use bioweapons against the vampires, the senator agreed without hesitation. She prepared three passes and train tickets to Washington for Ephraim, allowing him to send Zack away and bring back the pathogen's reactant with Nora. They would then use a biological reactor to mass-produce the pathogen and have the National Guard spread the virus which would only transmit among the vampires. Meanwhile, Abraham received a message from Cream and headed to Roosevelt Island with Fett. However, when they arrived, Cream took Fett's weapons and Abraham's silver sword. After confirming the authenticity of the ancient book, Cream took the deposit but didn't keep his promise. Instead, he decided to hold an auction, forcing Abraham to bid for the book with gold. In fact, Cream didn't care about the vampire plague because he had profited immensely from it. He even bought an island as a base. Abraham had no choice but to negotiate with Cream for 24 hours to raise funds. He had to turn to the three vampire ancestors for help. Abraham contacted Mr. Quinlan, explaining the situation with the book. 
Although the ancestors were wary of Abraham using the power of the book against them, they considered him less of a threat than the villainous blood master. If Palmer helped the blood master gain the ancient book, the consequences would be unimaginable. Abraham agreed to a mutually beneficial deal. He would return the book to the vampire ancestors after obtaining and examining it. Mr. Quinlan agreed to provide financial support, but didn't trust Abraham. He secretly asked Gus to find more human allies. Gus thought of his prison brothers and took Angel to the prison, which had already been invaded by the bloodthirsty virus. Most of the guards had been infected, and the defense system was paralyzed. As Gus and Angel cautiously entered, the infected inmates were still asleep. One guard had managed to survive, locking himself in a cell. He had once beaten Gus, but now, weak from hunger, he handed over his ID card, hoping Gus would save him. To his surprise, Gus took the card but ignored him, instead opening other cell doors to release the inmates he considered brothers. He handed out weapons and taught them how to fight vampires. However, a bearded man refused to obey Gus, ignoring his warnings and shooting the surviving guard. The gunshot awoke the infected inmates and chaos ensued. As the bearded man tried to escape, he attempted to take out Gus and become the new leader. Fortunately, Angel was there to protect Gus, killing the bearded man with a single shot. The others instantly submitted. When Gus reported back to Mr. Quinlan, he learned the true purpose of finding allies. If Abraham didn't hand over the ancient book to the vampire ancestors, Gus had to kill him and take the book by force. While Mr. Quinlan acted in secret, the Bloodmaster asked Thomas to get involved with finding the ancient book. He didn't trust Palmer and asked Thomas to attend the auction, with Palmer providing the funds. However, unlike Palmer, Coco couldn't tolerate Thomas's arrogance and advised Palmer not to follow the Bloodmaster blindly. Coco reminded him that he should have his own dignity, not just be manipulated. Nevertheless, Palmer still relied on the Bloodmaster to prolong his life. Despite feeling aggrieved, he swallowed his pride and agreed to provide funds the next morning. The day after, Ephraim finished packing his suitcase and took a group photo with Nora, Zack, and Abraham. Then, with their passes in hand, they headed to the train station. The three of them managed to catch the last train. While waiting on the platform, Nora and Ephraim shared a deep gaze, entrusting themselves to each other. However, their intimate moment was interrupted by the arrival of Kelly, who had come for Zack. Kelly's appearance foreshadowed an accident on the train, but the three of them had no clue. They boarded the train with the crowd and found their seats, only to discover a strong man sitting next to them. It was none other than Rudyard, who handed the ancient book to Cream. He and Cream expected to make a huge sum of money through the ancient book. Abraham and Fett arrived at the venue and had their weapons confiscated, as was customary. Then they revealed their bank accounts for Cream's men to verify and confirm that there was enough money. Abraham had assumed his auction opponent was Palmer, but it turned out to be his old enemy, Thomas. The two couldn't help but exchange bitter words. Thomas was humiliated again by the fact that the Bloodmaster had chosen Bolivar as his vessel. However, Cream didn't want to hear the two old men bicker and just wanted to wrap up the deal quickly. When his men confirmed the bank verification, Cream presented the ancient book for Abraham and Thomas to bid on. The two weren't stingy when spending other people's money bidding millions straight away. Eventually, they were piling billions on top of each other. This lavish behavior scared Cream, who said that he wasn't greedy, so since neither of them were short on money, they could simply compare their account balances. The one with the higher balance would be the auction winner, and they both agreed. Unfortunately, the vampire ancestors had given Abraham a little less than Thomas's. As a result, Thomas had a clear advantage and won. However, when Cream's men tried to transfer the money from Thomas's account, they realized it had been canceled. Thomas had thought he had everything under control, only to find himself outplayed by Palmer, who might have had a changed heart and canceled the credits. He wanted to seize the book on the spot, but Cream's power was too strong, and he could easily blow Thomas's head. Furious, Thomas left the scene. After several twists and turns, Abraham finally obtained the ancient book. They didn't dare to delay and drove away immediately, but the battle was far from over. The Bloodmaster was extremely wary of the book and would surely send his men to snatch it. Abraham didn't plan to hand over the book to the vampire ancestors either, so he knew he would be pursued. As Abraham and Fett discussed their options, a truck suddenly charged at them. Infected individuals swarmed from street corners, climbing onto the vehicle. Fortunately, the car had been temporarily modified, and the infected were stopped by the fine wire mesh, unable to reach inside with their tendrils. After dealing with several infected, Fett stopped the car and he and Abraham hid in the trunk. 
Thomas thought they were scared and ordered all the infected to climb onto the trunk, intending to retrieve the book and capture Abraham. However, as the infected tried to break in, several SUVs appeared nearby. A group of humans armed with silver bullets, including Gus and his newly recruited members, stepped out. The infected stood no chance against their firepower and were quickly eliminated. Thomas took advantage of the chaos to enter Abraham's car, but he was discovered by the arriving Mr. Quinlan. Thomas was no match for Mr. Quinlan, and the Bloodmaster had to step in to negotiate by possessing the body. However, their conversation proved fruitless, and Mr. Quinlan opened fire. The two powerful elite vampires pursued each other, while Gus and his teammates entered the trunk undercover. To their surprise, it was empty. They discovered a mechanism at the bottom of the trunk, pointing to a drain on the street. As he pondered, the sound of a bomb timer echoed through the train car, followed by a deafening explosion that lit up the night sky. Once again, the Bloodmaster's plan to steal the book had failed. Frustrated, Thomas went to confront Palmer, but the wealthy man had grown more assertive under Coco's influence. He demanded the Bloodmaster's attention and respect as a partner. For their collaboration to continue, not only would they need to treat each other with respect, but they would also need to provide each other with blood unconditionally. If the Bloodmaster was still interested in the ancient book, his security team could easily retrieve the book. Thomas's words had no effect on Palmer, and he was scolded by Coco. Left with no choice, he asked the Bloodmaster to intervene. When the Bloodmaster appeared, he acted decisively. Despite agreeing to Palmer's terms, he took Coco's life and turned her into one of them. At the train station, the train carrying Ephraim finally started moving. The passengers were excited to be leaving New York, but Ephraim felt the journey would be long, so he went to the train's dining car for drinks. The train's driver noticed people standing on the tracks up ahead, but the train was picking up speed and couldn't be slowed down in time. They were actually infected individuals controlled by Kelly, who wanted to stop the train. Chaos ensued in the train car and everyone rushed off. Nora took Zack and fled for their shitty life. In the dining car, Ephraim saw the scouts and realized Kelly had followed them. He returned to the train car to grab weapons. After dealing with the approaching scouts, he hurried off the train to find the others. Unfortunately, Kelly had intentionally separated them and sent scouts to delay Ephraim. Kelly found Nora, who immediately told Zack to seize the opportunity to escape. Nora stayed behind to fight Kelly one-on-one. -on -one. Initially, Kelly was powerless against Nora's silver weapons, and Nora was prepared to decapitate her. But when Zack saw his mother's anguished expression, he shouted for Nora to stop. This distraction allowed Kelly to strike back, hitting Nora's weapon-wielding arm. Nora couldn't escape the fate of being infected. At Zack's behest, Kelly didn't drain Nora's blood completely. Ignoring his father's previous warnings, Zack threw himself into his monstrous mother. The Bloodmaster's voice echoed through the void, and Kelly followed it, taking Zack to the villain's lair. When Ephraim finally arrived after dealing with the scouts, Nora's skin was already crawling with bloodworms, and the Bloodmaster's voice filled her head. In just a few hours, she would be transformed into a mindless monster, hunting the ones she loved the most. She didn't want to become a monster, so after briefly explaining the situation to Ephraim, she chose to end her life using the electricity from the nearby electrified rails. Just as Abraham and Fett escaped from the sewer, they dashed towards a boat docked by the water. However, Gus followed closely behind, urging Abraham not to break their agreement. Initially, Abraham thought that with both of them, they could easily handle Gus. But while he tried to distract Gus, Mr. Quinlan and Angel appeared to support Gus. Abraham had to explain to Mr. Quinlan that their common target is the Bloodmaster. The only thing in this world that the Bloodmaster fears is the ancient book, which would be definitely destroyed by the vampire ancestors if they get it, and there will be no chance to lure the Bloodmaster out. Mr. Quinlan was persuaded by Abraham, so, together with Gus and Angel, they boarded the boat Fett had stolen. The five of them drifted along the Hudson River, which was the best way to keep the Bloodmaster from stealing the book. During the journey, Abraham decided to unravel the secrets of the ancient book. However, the Bloodmaster's methods were far more ruthless than Abraham had imagined. Using Palmer's funding, he hired workers to build factories, producing iron cages with openings only at the top and numerous shiny hooks. He even had the contractor prepare a cremation furnace. The contractor asked Thomas what kind of animal they were processing. Thomas just replied, sheep. Now Palmer was powerless against the Bloodmaster. At the top floor of Stoneheart Group's building, he chose to cut open his beloved and remove Coco's heart. As Ephraim walked out of the train station, he faced the devastated New York City. 
Having lost Nora and Zack, he and his team needed a plan B to strike back at the Bloodmaster. And here concludes Season 2 of The Strain. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.